My number four best chess game of the 1930s is Paul Carey's vs. Edward Dykoff from about 1935. Today, players who live in locations without a lot of strong competition over the board are able to develop their skills online. In the 1930s, Carries did something similar through correspondence chess, becoming one of the absolute best players in the world as a young man when he played about 1,500 correspondence chess games. At one point, he had about 500 games going simultaneously, and to date, we have records of about 150 of those games, many of them very high quality encounters. Dykoff, on the other hand, was a player who at this point was in his 50s, and he was a champion of correspondence chess, doing much to promote the game. This particular encounter is a testament to the skills and fighting spirit of both players. Carries opens the game here with pawn to e4. We get e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, pawn to a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, and knight takes e4. The open Rui Lopez. I really always enjoyed games in the open Rui Lopez. There's just a lot of interesting and complex games that can occur. However, unfortunately, black does underperform a little bit relative to lines like the Berlin, so today you won't see it that much. I mean, you can't really be a top player and regularly give up a few percentage points in your games. So here, after knight takes e4, we see d4 and b5, bishop b3, d5, pawn takes e5, bishop e6. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the open Rui Lopez theory. There is a lot. There's many, many possible lines at every turn. This was cutting edge theory for 1935, which means that today there are definitely improvements, but neither player makes any significant inaccuracy. All of the moves do make sense and don't radically change the evaluation. This structure is really kind of the starting structure in the open Rui Lopez. Black has managed to develop some nice minor pieces, has a nice knight on e4, but on the other hand, there are some kind of structural weaknesses in the black position. For example, the pawn on d5, though well defended, can become vulnerable in many tactical lines, including some in this game. Also, in some cases, this pawn uh, or this square on c5 can become weak. If white is able to attack that square and maybe occupy it, he can have a very strong position using that as an outpost. On the other hand, sometimes black manages to arrange c5 and just roll through the center of the board, and there are always interesting ideas for counterplay with moves like f6. So many, many things can happen. Both players have interesting and dynamic trumps. So here we see pawn to c3 and bishop e7, bishop e3, black castles. Knight to d2, uh, going after the knight on e4, you always have to challenge this knight on e4 at some point. And now knight takes d2, queen takes d2, queen d7, and queen d3. This move is a little bit unusual, and it's probably one of the places that modern theory would kind of differ from this position, but it's also not a really bad move by any means. Knight a5 going after the bishop, which you want to retain. Bishop c2, which does provoke g6, which can create some weaknesses in the black position, though they are not easily exploited. Bishop h6, tickling the rook, and now an intermediate move before the rook moves. Bishop f5, looking to exchange off the light squared bishop. So queen over to e2, rook to e8, and this rook is lining up against the queen here, creating some tactical opportunities that black is going to exploit in this game. Knight to d4, and the threat here to the bishop means that black must exchange on c2. If you take back with the queen, then your knight immediately gets evicted and black is getting a pretty good game, so it makes more sense to take with the knight. After knight takes c2, we see bishop d6, and this is the tactics we were talking about on the e-file. In this position, it could be very easy to just lose the pawn on e5 and end up with a lost game for white, but Carries has some very interesting tactical ideas. So, First, he supports the pawn, pawn to f4, and black must continue going after this or black's game really doesn't make sense. Pawn to f6. It looks like white is just losing a pawn, but there are counterattacking ideas. Queen d3 attacking the undefended pawn on d5, and also creating some other ideas, as we'll see in a second. Now, black captures on e5, and white can capture on d5. Queen takes d5 check. 
But in this position, black will offer a queen trade and black is no worse at all in the coming position. It's very likely that this end game will lead to a draw. It is at least entirely balanced. Instead, carries plays the much more challenging move pawn to f5, which maintains the idea of possibly capturing on d5 in a little bit. And also you have the immediate attack on g6. One idea that I like here is that the move pawn to f5 kind of bypassing the e pawn here acts to close the line that black's rook is on, so the e-file is now not open, and it acts to open the line that white's rook is on. Now, there's a lot to calculate here. You can't reduce this move to such a simple kind of positional uh, evaluation here and say it's good because their rook doesn't have scope and my rook does. There's many things that are going to need to be calculated, but I do like this idea. Now we get bishop c5 check, king h1, and e4, black has made a couple of threatening moves, but queen g3, and now it is white who is making threats. The pawn on g6 is under attack, and white has some ferocious pieces arrayed in this position. White also has one piece very much out of play, but black has two pieces very much out of play. So bishop d6 tickling the queen, queen to g5, keeping the pressure here, and rook e5. There are a lot of tactics that are used in this game to counter the other player's threats. Rook e5, of course, pins the f-pawn here and elevates the rook, allowing this other rook to potentially come into the action. Now, knight e3, which stops the idea of rook takes f5 and introduces a very big threat of knight to g4, which would attack the rook and introduce the idea of knight to f6, which could be a royal fork. So it's really feeling like white is getting a lot going with all of these attacking pieces right now, and it feels like black is on the back foot. Black at this point, over the next couple of moves, comes up with a great set of defenses. Queen f7. So in this position, uh, among other things, if there's a capture on g6, the queen can potentially capture back. And also, if knight g4, then you're able to play rook takes f5 here. So now after queen f7, we see queen back to h4. We see knight c4, and at this point, black has anticipated the 28th move, which is really brilliant. So now the knight is under attack. This knight has been reintroduced from the edge of the board, and white needs to go for it. Carries has prepared. Pawn takes g6, and now with the queen under attack here, you have to take back with the queen. Queen takes g6, and then rook f6. And now suddenly it appears like the queen is just trapped and black is basically lost. For example, queen h5 and queen g3 with the idea of queen g7 checkmate is just winning on the spot. How is black going to counter this attack on the queen? There's no good square to move the queen to. Well, Dykov's prepared refutation, or at least counter, is rook h5, a really brilliant move that again must be anticipated. The queen is left hanging with check, but black has suddenly got huge threats on the h-file, going after the h2 pawn, the queen, and the bishop, and this is going to allow black to avoid losing material and even stay up material. So after rook h5, we get rook takes g6, pawn takes g6, and the queen must move, and she must abandon defense of this bishop here on h6. So queen f6, rook takes h2, picking off this pawn and opening up the h-file, and then pulling back to capture on h6. And actually, in this position, black is up one point in terms of material because black has a rook, a bishop, and two pawns for the queen. But of course, this is a very tactical position, and there's much to calculate. You can't just reduce things to a material count. In this position, carries plays queen g5, attacking the rook, and the g6 pawn. So you need to defend the rook. You can't move it and lose the g6 pawn. If you go for a king g7, the knight f5 immediately ends the game because of the pin here on this g pawn. So you must go king h7. And now carries really commits to the idea of attacking with the queen and knight. This position is very complex, and it's interesting that um, Throughout this game, there are a bunch of options for both players to kind of bail out and maybe sometimes reach equalish end games or try to force early perpetuals, but they're always trying to create uh, as much challenge for their opponent as possible, and that's what carries does with the brilliant knight g4. 
This move obviously goes after the rook here, but it sacrifices the rook on a1. Bishop c5 check. The king must go over to f1, and now rook h1 check. The king is forced to e2, and the rook on a1 is lost. Now black is up a lot of material, and white can't easily regain that much of it, but the queen and knight are now able to create a lot of threats. Things start with queen h6 check. Now, king back to g8, and the g6 pawn falls with check. King over to h8, and white easily has a perpetual here, but the question is, can white get some more? You know, black has a lot of loose pieces in this position. There are a lot of tactical ideas and even mating ideas that you can try to come up with. It turns out that black can hold the balance, but barely. So queen f6 check, king h7. Now, one idea I would try here is I would want to go for queen f7 check, king h8, and knight f6, trying to arrange an Arabian mate here on h7. But black has the only move, rook h1. Very, very, uh, <laughs> you know, resourceful to be able to defend all the way over here and just hold on. Now, knight h5 looks pretty scary because you're threatening this mate but then rook g8, and white still has a perpetual check starting with queen f6 check, but again, you're not winning the game. And there are probably more challenging moves like what carries plays. First, he goes for queen h6 check. He gives a few checks, but then in a moment, he takes on d5. Now he's hitting the bishop, hitting the rook, so he's regaining material here. He's hoping to pick off material and still have these mating ideas with the queen and knight and maybe win the game. So. Uh, at this point, Dykov is under pressure. He's got to find a counter, and he finds rook f8, an excellent move to hold things together. Queen h5 check, throwing in this check before capturing on c5. I kind of wonder if, you know, avoiding stepping onto the second rank so that this falls with check would have been more accurate, but it turns out it doesn't really matter. In either case, the game is within, you know, uh, the drawing margins. Now, black only has two moves to draw in this position. One is rook takes a2, which is interesting, but instead, and this is probably more sensible and practical, we see rook f f1, which keeps the rooks in coordination and threatens mate down here with rook over to e1. This threat is really, really hard to stop, and it turns out that if white doesn't want to just give a perpetual, he's going to have to allow this move and cover it with the queen, giving up the queen for the two rooks. So queen takes e7 check, king g6, and you could calculate here knight e5 check, by the way. That's, this is another alternative if you're really trying to win, but this may be too risky, although this is still a balanced game. Because you're eliminating the knight on c4, this will no longer be mate. So white uh, black now needs to capture on e5. And then there's queen takes e5, rook e1 check, king d2, e3 check, king d3. There are, at this point, multiple options. One interesting line is rook d1 check. You can never capture here because, of course, you would get skewered and lose the game. So king c2, rook d2 check, king b3, e2. And this is one of many lines where, again, white is going to be able to arrange a perpetual check because black's king is just too exposed. Um, neither player is really able to win, but they've certainly been trying as hard as they possibly can. Instead, Carries plays the move queen g3, which covers e1 and obviously has huge threats in the position. Lots of knight discoveries. So Dykov plays rook to e1 check. Carries has to sacrifice his queen or give up his queen for the two rooks. And now in the end, we see knight takes b2, and finally material equality is restored in a knight endgame. This knight endgame is a draw. Maybe the players thought there might be some chance to press, but both players are able to get their king into active squares and attack the opponent's vulnerable pawns. If I had to pick a side in this position, I would want to be white because I've kind of got an outside pass pawn, but good play from black really holds the balance pretty comfortably. So king f5 attacking the knight, the knight comes back to e3 with check, king f4, uh, and here uh, you do need to be a little careful about knight c4 check, which can give black a winning end game. For example, if you're like, I'm going to push my outside past pawn, then knight c4 check, knight takes, pawn takes, and black just wins. But of course, neither player is going to do that. They've played basically perfectly so far, so they're not gonna make a mistake like that. We see knight d5 check, king to e5, knight c7, and a pawn is falling over here, but knight c4 check, king e2, and the excellent move, knight to a3. The point is that after knight takes a6, for a moment, white is up a pawn, but then knight b1, 
and this knight is controlling both d2 and attacking c3, so black gets back to equality, and after knight b4, knight takes c3 check, the players agree to draw. It is a dead even endgame. This is just an absolute, you know, slugfest. Both players are going for it throughout this game. Both players found brilliant moves. It's one of the best draws I've ever seen. You know, sometimes draws have a bad reputation in chess, but not a game like this. This one is truly, truly exciting. I hope that you enjoyed this game. If you want to see more of my favorite chess games of the 1930s, then simply click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen as I speak.